in our trainings around innovation, we have one slide that talks about the paradox of expertise when it comes to innovation. And that says, um, you cannot innovate without expertise. And at the same time, you cannot innovate because of your expertise. Oh, Florian, great to see you again. Yes, uh, good to see you. James. It's been a while and you're a bit further away these days. So maybe um, we could start in the conversation today with you saying a little bit about who you are and, and where you are perhaps and just what's going on for you in life right now. Yeah, all right. So um, from, uh, well, depending from where people watch this, um, Maybe just in the background, you know, it's over there, you see a remote control, uh, which is a remote control for an air condition, uh, for an air con, because I'm in, uh, I'm in Taiwan, in Taipei, to be um, more exact, exactly where I moved to last year in August. Um, I'm a co-founder of a consulting and training company called Career Effective. Um, we focus on innovation, agile organization, and effective collaboration. Um, and more due to personal reasons, I, we as a family decided to uh, move here to Taiwan. And um, well, in hindsight, I'm, I'm I'm very lucky because I can continue working. I can continue to work with most of our customers back in Europe through virtual ways. Uh, thanks to COVID-19, uh, who made that an option for everybody, at least in Europe. Um, it's different here. So in Taiwan, where I am, um, COVID is not happening. So there is no lockdown, no nothing, um, which is interesting because I feel like I'm on a, an alternate planet sometimes. It, it feels like this. Um, but it also means that some things that... Um, I would say we in in rest of the world um, have been forced to experiment with um, people here didn't, and so some things are not happening. So that's quite interesting to see also. Interesting, and has that been consistently across the last year? Um, you mean not having a pandemic? Yeah. Yeah. So it's. Uh, yeah, Taiwan is interestingly, it's not so much in the news, but it's basically the country that deals with this the best in the world. So since the outbreak of in January 2020, until now, in total, there have been less than 950 cases. So all over. Um, and and the vast majority of them have been imported to people coming on airplanes. Um, and um, the, the policy here is that everybody who arrives on the island, regardless of where they come from, um, they will be isolated for two weeks. And so 98% of all cases um, are detected during quarantine. Um, and so it never spreads into the larger population. Okay. So that's 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 quite interesting interesting to see um yeah it makes it it makes it pretty special especially compared to my colleagues and friends and family i have conversations with in europe every day as i know the situation is different yeah yeah well I, I can't help but draw some loose parallels to it, the benefits of a strict selection recruitment process and onboarding process <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah that's right yes uh, it helps yes <laughs> So, Florian, I asked if we could get together today for a conversation because um, next month in the S3 Online Learning Community Practitioner Lounge, you're going to be offering a workshop there on effectuation. And thanks very much for that. I'd like to get to that a bit later and you can explain a bit more about effectuation specifically. But if we zoom out from that, I've had the pleasure of knowing you for some years now. We've collaborated in various ways. You were responsible for organizing a number of uh, S3 
practitioner courses in Munich before you left and also quite active actually in generating, mobilizing people to get together, looking at uh, the world of work. And your or oh, an area of specialism for you, I know, is innovation. So I wanted to have a conversation with you about that today. Yeah. Um, Great. And um, I was triggered into contacting you when I saw that you were announcing the uh, next release of one of your five books that you've written. Um, and all of your books have been focused in some way or other around the topic of innovation, agile organization, and effective collaboration. And this book, Thinking Tools for Creativity and Innovation, has been a bit of a bestseller. And um, I was wondering if you could kind of just dive in a little bit to this topic, like your background with it, why it fascinates you, um, and perhaps from there, just lead into some examples of what you've been doing with that area of work over the last years and, and maybe how that segues a bit with S3 as well. Yeah. Okay. Um, so why is it fascinating me? Um, I, I can't really explain actually why it's fascinating me. I just find it fascinating. Um, but I know that one of my, um, maybe a brief back of my starting point is I got exposed very early, um, very early means being 15 years old, um, to a tool for visualization called mind mapping. I think most people would know, right? Those looks like a bit like a spider web. Um, and it was the first time in my life that I got exposed to a tool that would help me improve my thinking. And that, for me, that was a new concept. So I just like, okay, um, cool. I can I can draw a web on a, on a piece of paper and it helps me think better. And I, that was intriguing. Um, and I started exploring from there, and then I pretty quickly um, came around um, tools and techniques also for creative thinking. And then, um, yeah, that got me me triggered really in exploring. Um, I then went to uh, the International Center for Studies in Creativity to dedicate myself two years really in depth about um creativity, a creative process, um, and innovation, and also how potential practices and tools or more explicit practices and tools could help support that uh, and support that thinking process and help groups uh, and individuals um, to be better innovative thinkers. So that means to come up with new solutions that bring value in what in the specific context. Um, and the my book, Thinking Tools, um, it's really a book that, um, yeah, basically I was looking for it. I couldn't find it. And then I said, well, why not write one? Um, it's, it's basically a very practical book from a, um, creative thinking practitioner to other practitioners that, that want to support, um, a creative and innovative thinking process in groups, in organizations, um, with specific little practices and tools. Um, and basically what I did is, so it's, it's, I would always say is there is not much new in there in the sense of I didn't invent any tools. Um, but I think what I did and what this book seems to be doing a good job for people is that I um, organized them in a way that makes sense for people to identify when to use which tool and, and, and how to find those tools. So basically there are some, uh, you, you could call that uh, some um, process models for creative thinking out there that are all a bit, all similar. So design thinking is maybe the most known one, but there are other models as well. Um, uh, with proposal forming being one in uh, S3, um, which is also a very basic creative process. They all look kind of the same. Um, and what you then can do once you understand such a basic process and some basic principles around it, you can add in specific little thinking tools, for example, to help you generate ideas or to help you evaluate ideas or to help you prototype. Um, and the book is basically um, a, a collection of a lot of different uh, thinking tools for creativity and innovation um, organized in a way that is accessible for people and explained in a very simple way. So basically two little pages and a visualization per tool so that um, it's really just what's needed to start using it. That was my intention and that's what the 
And that is what the book is about. And um, yeah, I think some commonalities I see with, uh, with uh, S3 uh, is, first of all, yeah, in S3, there is, there is also a collaborative or co-creative process of coming to proposals. Um, and proposal forming is basically a, I call it, it's a quick and dirty version of the um, more refined creativity processes. So it makes it just very simple um, and, and quick to use, which is a very good thing. Um, so, so that's um, a commonality here that these things are um, brought together. And then what, what we also have in S3 is that um, we have a collection, we have a pattern map, right, of, of interaction patterns and practices. Um, and I see that a bit similar to, okay, my book has thinking tools and you can use tools depending on the context and on your need, bring them in. If they work, fine. If they don't, take another one and, and see what, what helps. Right? And um, so I see there, there's a commonality. Um, there's a commonality here as well. It's a library of, uh, a library of patterns. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I'm curious because you were suggesting that behind a lot of these different uh, practices, there's some common kind of patterning. And in S3, we decided that we would zoom out from proposal forming and just talk about the meta level of co-creating proposals. And it was our observation too, that generally speaking, a collaborative creative process, or even just an in intra-psychic one of an individual follows or could follow a similar kind of trajectory. And could you say something more about that? What have been your observations? Are there like radically different ways towards co-creation um and innovation or is there an underlying kind of meta pattern that guides them all yes yeah, so i would see a, 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 a generic process that is in that can be in some details a bit different but in general that's just i remember back in in the us in my um at the international center for studies in creativity they called it the universal creative process because it's really very much universal which is basically uh you have a motivation to be creative, so like a driver, a driver summary, a case for action. So why, why would I want to do something? Uh, and then the, 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 the universal process is once you know that, then you, you clarify the background. You try to understand what the problem is. Once you know that, you transform from the problem to a solution. So you come up with ideas. And at the end, you prepare how to implement. So that's in a very, very simple way, the basic universal process. Um, you can then dive deeper into it and, and filter out some more steps in between to make it more specific. But it's always that general process of understanding, transforming, and starting to implement and preparing implementation. So that's like the, the, the generic, general creative process. And, and another aspect is um, there's like a basic principle behind this process, which is a, a, the key a principle is of um, separating diverging and converging thinking. So that means there are two types of thinking, right? One is open and expanding and basically looks into different alternatives without um, evaluating them yet. And the second, the converging uh, phase is basically um, evaluating options and filtering out the most, um, the ones that have most potential. Um, these are two distinct phases of thinking. And what all those creative processes normally do is that they separate those two phases. So that means while you diverge, you shouldn't converge. Um, and one way how you realize that you're actually doing it, which most of us are, is that you have in your head or in a group conversation, you have somebody that says, yes, but. Right? And that means we're, we're mixing up the two and we're not separating them. Right? So you have an idea, we could do this. Uh, yes, but James, that don't work, doesn't work. Uh, yes, but James, we've um, we've never done it this way. So that's already mixing up the two. And by doing this, um, it's very hard to come up with new solutions that provide value. So an underlying principle of all creative processes is that we try to separate diverging and conversion thinking and do it one step at a time and not at the same time. Okay. That's interesting because I was going to come around and ask you, like broadly speaking, about do's and don'ts based on your experience. But I guess this is one of the keys, right? Is we we converge when it's better to diverge, and we can diverge when it's better to converge. And maybe you could speak a bit more to yeah. that. 
Yeah, so I think um, if, if, if there's that would be a very basic um, habit that we try to get into and that would provide a lot of value if people could manage to, to get there uh, is really to develop a thinking habit to separate the two, right? And, and really, while I'm diverging, I, I might notice that I have a yes spot voice in my head, but I, I say to this voice, basically, uh, hold on a bit, not now. Yes, I hear you, but not now. Um, and, and I try to build on ideas that I have. Um, so I go for quantity, I try to build on them, I try to make connections. So really getting into this very um, um, broad way of thinking. And then when it comes to converging, it's it's about selecting, but at the same time, we try to cultivate that habit of um, still seeing the value in something. So we, we try not to, to go through things and say, let me tell you why this doesn't work, but it's it's more about going through things and thinking about, so why, what's the value in this? Even if it sounds like a crazy idea, what could be the value in this? And, and then trying, gently trying to develop this into something that could actually work. Um, and that's also a, a key, a key um, challenge in, the, in this creative process um, that on the one hand, we, we don't um, allow ourselves to, to think bold and broad enough. And then on the other hand, being too realistic too soon. Right and, and not being open to boss possibilities, and I think that's a very that's a very um, key um, habit of of the mind basically to develop, also to deliberately look for the value in new ideas while we are selecting right? and really thinking about. It. So even if it doesn't work this way, but what's the value in this? What we'll put, what could we keep here, and how could we make it work? Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um. So I'm thinking about the case for co-creation because it's an investment of time and energy for people to come together and co-create. Um, and I think there are instances when that's more or less helpful. Um, in a micro way, I'm reminded of a session where we were co-training and you were facilitating a proposal for me. And we got to the harvesting ideas round and People do that silently for themselves first, which avoids distraction from others. It enables people just to reflect in their own world. But then people share their ideas. And then I remember you went through a few further iterations. Uh, and, and out of that came a, a, an absolute waterfall of ideas from people. You know, we were inundated with them in, in just a few minutes. Um, so it's fantastic to see. But what what's the case for co-creation and i think there's an obvious underlying scenario here which is complexity um, i'm reminded of the fact that none of us are smart enough to navigate complexity alone um, and it seems to me that this is kind of an underlying case where co-creation might be valuable but i'm curious what your thoughts are around this when yeah. is it worth the time when is the output exceeding the cost yeah so I would very similar. So there, there are two reasons, or well, maybe even more. Um, so one reason I can think of is it's a it's a challenge or a question that I know I cannot solve on my own because either I don't have enough knowledge or I um I need other perspectives. Um and it's just something either can be too complicated or too complex or both, right? For one person to solve. Um, that's a lot. And, and I would say um, it, in, in all the innovation work, um, it's in today's world, it's actually almost impossible that everything comes from one person because uh, the, the areas are just too broad, too specialized, and he, there's nobody who has an understanding of all the elements. So basically, we need to co-create um, because we need to get different people with different um, expertises together uh, to collaborate and to come up with something new that works. And there's always there's this this uh, saying that says innovation happens at the edges of discipline. So that means um, we have to go to the edge, and we we need people of different different disciplines to go to their edge and find overlaps and then be be creative. So that's that's one reason. Um, and I think the other aspect um, is very simply that there can be, um, you might be able to come up with a solution yourself, 
um, but there might be um, the people who have to live with your solution or accept your solution might have a resistance to it if you don't include them in the process of coming up with it. So, and that's an, a, another reason for co-creation is um, in order to have um, higher commitment on a decision and then increase the likelihood that it actually gets acted on, acted upon, and, and that people stick to their commitment, uh, it's good to include people in that process to come to the proposal and then to the decision. So that would be another reason yeah. why you would co-create, I would say. So, so it's relevant in uh, both complicated and complex environments. If you're in a complicated environment and you need expertise besides your own. Um, yeah. But also yeah. the other side, as you're saying, maybe sometimes the argument in and of itself for co-creation is isn't so strong, the need's not so strong, except for the fact that you're going to generate ownership of whatever's decided, yeah. and then people will be on board with that and be inclined to uh, be accountable for that in a way that they wouldn't otherwise. Yeah. And and that's you, you, and you see often this combination in, in organizations um, that, like, for a lot of, so I've been facilitating a lot of technical innovation workshops, and there it's really more the complicated world um, where it's just, yeah, you need the experts of different fields to come up with the solution. But then again, they all sometimes represent different areas of the organization. Um, and also just the fact that they represent these areas and they are part of that process um, it then dramatically increases the likelihood that whatever comes out of this actually um, gets implemented. Um, and, and that was actually the, the reason why in a few a few years back, um, we as an organization started to look from organ uh, from innovation to the broader organizational context because there were have been a few a few um, instances where um, I realized um, in a very frustrating way that often it's not about it, an, a new solution in terms of a new product or service or business model. Um, but it's about the organization that um, hinders the solution, that doesn't allow the solution to come into the world. Um, and therefore, I see a very tight connection between innovation and the organization that has to make the innovation happen or allow innovation to happen. So I see those very, very tightly connected. Okay, well, let's get into that a bit more then. Maybe we can take what you were saying previously as a frame. So we've got complicated environments, complex environments, both of which warrant and in fact necessitate co-creation input of others. And then what you're describing here is that as well as people being involved in decisions that affect them locally, you've also got the organization as a whole. And in your example you gave, you've got representatives from different significant domains which kind of gives you an ally in each of those domains, somebody who's actually on the page with that agreement and um, what that's going to require of that particular domain of which they're part. Um, so, because I know that you um, you kind of came to S3 via Holacracy um, and you were, you, you were sharing in the community about early experiences you had going from being the manager into this new context and being challenged somewhat and, and just that journey you went through as a, as an organization of a kind of transfer of power to influence in the system and uh, constraints being adjusted, sometimes to limit people more, sometimes to enable people more, but overall to enable the organization to function more effectively as a whole. So could you say yeah. something about this? The example you mentioned uh, that was recently in the community we spoke about, so how actually a structure could influence um, culture. Right, and um, that was a very I found a very a personal example and a very simple example because we are basically just one team. Um, but uh, yeah, in the past, when before we started without with um, holacracy and S three, um, we were like a a, a normal traditional um, small enterprise um, being set up with basically one team and a general manager or managing director or whatever you call that, but that, that one person that often is then on the, in, the, in the lead. Um, 
And um, as I was, as as I am the the, the founder, um, it was uh, in an unreflected way. Uh, I ended up being that person, um, and that of course came with certain habits and, and patterns also. Um, and one one pattern in, in the past that we had that that started actually our also our journey to we have to be more self organized uh, was that um, most of the decisions ended up with me uh, that I thought I have to make them or I was asked to make them that was unsatis uh, unsatisfactory for all of us and once we started in um, Introducing the concept of roles and having clear domains and having responsibilities for those roles, um, dynamics shifted. And um, then one aspect was um, that, yeah, you would have to, starting in the early on with holacracy, uh, you were always asked, so in what role are you speaking? Uh, in, in, from what, from which role are you asking stuff? And, um, and, um, what what is it that you want me to do? And and what I realized at that time is um, that often I didn't have a role. Um, it was just me um, falling back into the pattern of, of wanting to know things that um, I as as I would have asked in previous times as a managing director, right? And with that new um, structure in place that we have roles and that they have to, that they have to explicitly say from which role you're speaking and, and and also give people a reason why you need to know that um or you why you want to know that um that triggered an interesting reaction from my colleagues because they would basically feedback to me to say well um you don't have any role in in which you want to do this it's it's, it's basically you and your behavior patterns that that we can't see here and that was very yeah, that was very interesting. It was also a bit of a, in the beginning, a bit of a, a shock to me because um, I, I suddenly realized that the the system we implemented very much changed the way things were done and, and, and mm-hmm. what I could do. Um, yeah, so that was a very yep. that was a very interesting experience. Yeah, thanks for sharing the story. So, if we bring that around to your work with organizations. And this overlap between innovation and um, organizational development in general. So I, I guess there's some parallels here, or this has informed you in some way in your work with organizations, because perhaps generally people in organizations reach out for, to you around innovation. Um, and along the journey, then you discover some of the th- aspects of the organization itself that stand in the way of that innovation. So you're presenting arguments for involving others uh, for the reasons that we said, and there might be some resistance or at least vulnerability around that that happening. So can you say something about some general observations and like some of your work in loosening people up in organizations to be able to allow innovation to happen to start with, or at least yeah. allow the environment to be there that innovation can grow yeah. from? Yeah. Um, innovation is actually um, a very a very good area um, where, in general, a lot of organizations are open to experiment with different approaches. Um, and so, and and often, w- what I see now is that many organizations are aware that, let's say, the traditional approach they often took towards innovation um, is not fast enough or the things that come out are not meeting the requirements of their of the market. So that means they're not agile enough in the sense of they're not adapting quickly and effectively to changing circumstances. So that's what that's and that's a good thing because many organizations um, realize that and they're looking for ways of how to make their approach to innovation more flexible and uh, being able to respond to changing circumstances. Um, and that's a, that's, a, that's a very cool um, combination, actually, because then what we then do is that and a lot, of, a lot of, um, of the recent consulting projects that we have had in the past would be that we would think together with the organization, how can we introduce um, more elements of self-organization into your innovation process. And the beauty of this is that 
you can actually change your approach to innovation and the innovation process and sometimes also the structures without necessarily having to change or affect the the entire rest of the organization that much, right? It's it's, it's a bit like even very, very um, traditional hierarchical organizations can take um, a separate, much more self-organized approach to innovation without really completely affecting and, and interfering with their existing setup. Um, so actually, innovation, in my view, is a good starting point um, because, yeah, first of all, organizations are uh, seeing the need um, to change um, and they're willing to experiment. And you can experiment in that area um, yeah, without immediately changing everything else, um, which is often one reason that some organizations um, are a bit hesitant because it's a, it's a big operation if you start to change from, from all over the place. Um, but you could start with innovation and innovation management and the innovation process and, and take this experiments and bring it into other areas of the organization. Um, and th that is something that um, we've come across um, a few times now in the last years, which is a nice synergy, actually, um, of looking at the innovation process and introducing more elements of self-organization and then also S3 um, into the innovation part of an organization. Yeah, so it's removing the hurdle to integrating something new in response yeah. to a very clear driver that's recognized as important and people are ready to yeah. make the investment in, into yeah. that. Yeah. yeah. Um, I had a couple of quite specific questions, and then I wanted to move across into um, effectuation a bit more. But uh, one, one, this is a personal thing for me. I read some time ago the challenge of the idea that innovation kind of happens just from the grassroots. It was arguing for the importance of the expert in innovation. And it was just a passing phrase I read in the midst of a bunch of things I was reading one morning. But could you say something about that? You know, like the role of expertise in innovation, mm -hmm. maybe limitations to that. Okay. You know. Yeah. Um, there is this. It, so in, in our uh, trainings around innovation, we have one slide that says, that talks about the paradox of expertise when it comes to innovation. And that says, um, you cannot innovate without expertise. And at the same time, you cannot innovate because of your expertise, because you're confined to your expertise and you, you can't leave your box, basically. I and mean, I think it's, so both is true. Um, I think in most areas, um, innovation benefits from expertise um, because, because you're an expert and you know something really well, you are able to make connections that other people have not made yet. But if you don't know anything about the details, you can't make connections, right? And when you, when you see, for example, um, new startups coming up, uh, let's say currently you see a lot of startups in the uh, like fintech startups in the finance and banking industry. But when you look at the founders of these startups, they, many of them have a background from banking, finance, and insurance. Uh, because they know the details and they know what's not working, but at the same time, they're open enough to make new connections uh, and, and, and innovate. Um, so I think um, expertise is definitely a contributing factor and also a limiting factor. So that means, and how do we tackle that? That's the whole argument for diversity, so that you try to bring different experts together that are that have a broad enough knowledge to be able to communicate with each other. And at the same time, they have a deep expertise in some field um, and those having fruitful conversations. Um, and then the other aspect that I mentioned already in the past is um, be able to diverge and converge and keep them separate. Um, and that's, that's often the biggest challenge for the experts that any new idea you give them, there is this very loud yes, but that doesn't fit to my current expert pattern. And that makes it very challenging for them. If we, if we can get those people to say, okay, what if this was possible? How would we go for this? Um, then we are having a, a different conversation. And that's what, what's called the paradox of expertise. So I, I don't believe that 
that in, in most cases, that sometimes people suggest that you can just go to the street, uh, collect some random person walking on the street and say, can you help us figuring this out? Um, it may be sometimes that works, but in most of the times it doesn't because they don't have enough adjacent knowledge to actually start a conversation with you. Yeah, I love that quote. So it's, you can't innovate without expertise. You can't innovate because of your expertise. <laughs> and both is true, yeah. Yeah, and both is true. This reminds me of an article I was reading by Snowden this morning. He was challenging the notion that competence is is like the, always the most valuable asset when it comes to orientating in complexity. And mm -hmm. then he was talking about it might also be the strength of somebody's interaction network, you know, their, their interconnectedness with others and their ability mm -hmm. to harness distributed intelligence in that way. And it also reminds me of Endenberg's idea to shift from managed team to circle as well, um, because it doesn't diminish anything of the, the voice of anybody in a team with expertise, but it also shifts supremacy to argument and mm -hmm. in, engages a co-creative process rather than one where somebody can easily slip into dominating the process due to self-assumed or perhaps actual expertise. Yeah. 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 And that would be a big waste, right? That you have a, a bunch of people knowing a lot, but they're not heard or they're not used in the process of coming up with a solution. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So my my other quite specific question was just a curiosity. Now you're there in Taiwan, um, mm -hmm. because clearly there's some cultural differences, Taiwan to here. And I was thinking about this role of experts. I was thinking about ways organizations organize themselves, uh, the, the role of more or less formal hierarchy. And when I look to Taiwan, it's a pretty innovative culture, right? But I'm curious what your thoughts are around that. Is there like a paradox? Is it, is it true? Is it just my projection? There's a lot of innovation there. And or is there something culturally there that might stand in the way of, of uh, innovating in yeah. more effective ways? Yeah. Um, so my, my, my perception and my, my thoughts around this are still evolving. Um, so I've, I have a connection to the country for 20 years now, and I, I, I'm fluent in Mandarin, so I do kind of understand the culture. Um, so there is, um, there is innovation here in Taiwan, and there is, there's like certain um, um, expertise in certain domains uh, where Taiwan is very strong. Um, like at the moment, uh, there is this company, uh, TSMC, so Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company that the whole world is depending on. So at the moment, no cars are made because TSMC can't deliver the chips. Uh, Apple is waiting for them. So there is some very, very deep um, technical expertise and especially around process innovation um, happening here in Taiwan. Um, and there's some 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 good engineering background in engineering culture. So that's something very strong here in Taiwan. Um, at the same time, my perception is there is a lot more potential here that is um, not harnessed. Um, part, and there's a, a good reason, is, is also um, a cultural reason um, in the way um, yeah, companies are organized and the, the culture in the organization is. So what, what I perceive here very much um, is that it's still a very, a very, very hierarchical um, society and also companies are organized in a very hierarchical way. And there is a big um, power distance in the organization. So that means you have very few people that make almost all of the decisions and the majority of people can hardly make any decision. Um, so looking back at what we just spoke about, harnessing the different perspective and people being able to influence decisions, um, that's something that is not very present here. Um, and that does have also an effect on innovation um, because it's very often you're basically relying on people at the top, hopefully seeing the need or making the right decisions, uh, and which is in a complex environment, a more and more challenging assumption that you can rely on a few people uh, on top making those decisions. And um, 
you you have like a, a, a also a generational shift here um so that you have a lot of founder run companies where the founder is still active and they basically um they they work in the company and make the decisions until they pass away so you have people with 80 90 um without who nothing gets done in the organizations because all the decisions still have to run through them um and that's that's also a big of a challenge for some organizations here because you have some other people who have ideas but they basically have to wait until their time comes um, and i see that is also um a limiting factor when it comes to innovation here in taiwan and in, in general uh, in the organizational culture i see that is not something very conducive to innovation if you have a very high power distance um i, I would also say a is that a word in english um um patriarchic way of leadership so from like parent, from, parent, parent child i'm yes, not sure the word parent child but, relationship yeah. very much yeah. like this um that that goes both ways actually so it's not just people from above acting like this but also people expecting exactly there's a kind of collusion with the dynamic on both yeah. ends yeah. yeah um but that doesn't make it easier for yeah. um for innovation so that's that's what i what i see here but at the same time there are lots of startups here and young people want to doing their own thing so um and then there's a good a good infrastructure so it's it's also yeah there's a lot of potential but i i i feel um it's not yet fully leveraged that potential i'm reminded of a conversation i had with a, a young woman she was in her it couldn't be more than late 20s uh, and why that's relevant is she'd been charged with building relationships with the the kind of uh well, it was the, the elders in the physics community um, specialized in nuclear. And so she was working primarily with 70, 80 year old uh, scientists who developed the whole nuclear industry in Russia. And mm -hmm. the problem that they were trying to solve was the fact that there had been no transfer of knowledge, mm -hmm. you know, and understanding. So a lot of the, mm -hmm. the, the, experience that had informed the evolution of that industry hadn't been passed on through the generations and so they were reaching a critical kind of moment and mm -hmm. the, the irony was she was in her late 20s you know so of course they weren't okay. taking her very seriously either yeah. um but yeah. that that was a you know a, a real a very real threat actually mm -hmm. i mean whatever your views on nuclear you know but for that industry yeah. Uh, they really needed to find a new way to deal with things. And there was a, it wasn't good enough to just wait for the elders to pass <laughs> because yeah. the elders were taking with them something that was really valuable. Yeah. So how to build, how to build that relationship, how to yeah, build a, a little kind of humility and openness on both sides. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But maybe that's a whole nother conversation. Yeah. yeah. So I wanted to bring it around to the fact you're going to be running this workshop on effectuation, which I'm yeah. really looking forward to. You're a certified effectuation expert. Um, yeah, so a certificate for everything. I have one. Of exactly. Those. Yeah. So <laughs> I'd love to know a bit more about what that's about, but more more for the purpose of this conversation, like approximately what is effectuation and why is it important for organizations? people in yeah. general and the world. Yeah. So effectuation is is basically, let me try if I can phrase it in a different way. It's a, a reverse engineered process of way of thinking and acting of entrepreneurs. So they basically looked at how do entre successful entrepreneurs that create new things under conditions of uncertainty. That's the premise. How do those people think and act? What is it that they do? And there was a bit of an evolution because in the past, uh, and, and so this was basically a research initiated project looking at practitioners, right? And saying, is there something that we can learn the way how they do it and that we can basically try to emulate or replicate some like basic principles around this? And basically, effectuation is that entrepreneur's method that is based on intensive research around how entrepreneurs think and act. 
and 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 on, on, as an entrepreneur here being defined as somebody who manages to create new solutions under conditions of uncertainty. Um, so so that's that's what effectuation is is all about. And then it's basically um, again, it's a set of principles um, that can be connected with a variety of tools and methods and practices. But uh, a bit similar to S3, um, the principles are actually more important than a very specific practice because you can you might always have to tweak the practice to fit your context. Um, but the principle behind it is always relevant. And um, so what effectuation has done is it 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 kind of contrasts the um, the managerial cause and effect logic that many managers use, which is very appropriate in a lot of cases. And then the entrepreneurial approach, so effectuation, um, which is appropriate in in any situation where there is uncertainty and complexity and you need to come up with something new that works in that situation. And that's where effectuation has its place. So mm -hmm. again, I see, yeah, there's because when we talk about S3 again, it's also about navigating complexity. Uh, and that also means in, in complexity, we would also deal with uncertainty. So these things um, reappear. And I would even say, that um, you can take the effectuation principles to apply them, for example, to organizational change and using patterns of S3. But the way you apply them would use principles of effectuation to, to, um, to navigate. Okay, so there are a few. So one of the principles um, of effectuation is uh, that you would focus on your means instead of specific goals. So you would basically start off, who am I? What do I know? Whom do I know? What can I do? Um, and when you think about organizational change, you could also go and say, okay, if you want to make a change, uh, this is the group of people here. What are our means that we can immediately use to do to start a change? Right? So instead of saying, well, it would be nice if, and then we would need all those conditions, we could say, okay, what is available right now, what are what is within our means and what could we do with the means we have? So that would be one aspect. Another aspect would be that instead of um, focusing on return on investment, you would focus on affordable loss. So that means what would you be willing to lose 100% to go to the next step? So what would you be willing to try? So when we talk about organizational change, that could mean what could be an experiment that we're willing to try that if it fails completely, would not kill the organization or ourselves. Um, it would be a pity um, and we would learn something from it, but it would be a loss that we can afford. And from that, then we could always start and say, okay, so what, what do we have at our disposal? What are our means? And what are we willing to do? What loss can we afford? And if we get commitment, we can take a next step, right? And that would then mean instead of having those change uh, management goals and plans and milestones and things set up, we would take a much more iterative and experimental approach to say, okay, what are you prepared to do? What are you ready to do? What can you imagine? Something that brings you a bit onto the edges of your comfort zone, but something you, are, you can imagine still to do Let's run an experiment, let's look at the experiment, and let's take the next step from there. And so this, this will be incorporating some principles of effectuation into organizational change. Yeah, I got it. So there's very close parallels to S3, right? Start with the driver, look at what you have available, make the best yes. with your limited time, energy, and resources, focus more on the process than the outcome itself, and then kind of respond to whatever emerges. Yeah. 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 And then in terms of like a specific example of any recent kind of experiences with that in an organizational context, not, we don't have to go into the details, but I'm just kind of curious about a problem people were trying to solve and how applying some of these principles helped them get through it in a way that they couldn't have previously. Um, well, the, the, the kinds of projects that currently um, we are having would again be, um, it's all connecting it again, but 
how could we introduce um, more elements of, of self-organization into our work? Um, and we would then take exactly that approach that I just uh, said, that is, okay, um, this is your situation. Here are a few options of what we think might be helpful for you, given your current situation. Um, but instead of telling you now do this, do that, um, let's come together and see which of the things you've just seen or experienced you could imagine to try out. Uh, and then let's define an experiment. Um, let's, let's use it for a few weeks or even months. Um, and let's learn on the way. And then let's have a review date where we see how the experiment goes and then take our next steps from there. Um, that is a tough, uh, a tough sale here in uh, Taiwan uh, because uh, in general, organizations are very uncomfortable with uncertainty. Um, and they would like to have a very exact plan of what we will do and when we will do what. And, and me telling them, I have no idea what we will do exactly. And I cannot tell you when we will do what. I don't even know what people would pick from. And I also don't know the outcome. Um, <laughs> creates a maximum frustration on their side. And of course, it doesn't make it a lot easier for me. But um, I still try to advocate for that approach because I, I think uh, it, it has a higher chance to work in that situation, because I would say organizational change is definitely a complex domain. Um, yeah. And so we better use an approach that's suitable for that domain uh, instead of having a very clear plan with goals and milestones that stops working on day two of our yeah. initiative. Yeah, that can be a, an uncomfortable conversation. I had one like that myself recently. I don't think I was as eloquent and clear as I could have been either, but there was certainly some cognitive dissonance between expectations and what I actually had to say, and it didn't really end, end particularly well, I think. But there's something I, I appreciate your, your honesty and integrity in that because um, I think it's true, and so I appreciate you doing that, even though it sometimes involves a few hard knocks, I know. Yeah, yes, yeah. yes. And the, 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 the big power distance in organization doesn't make it easier because basically often you would have people, well, before I can get that decision, I need to be yeah. able to tell them a specific outcome. And you're telling me you can tell me, so how can I, how can I get buy-in, right? Yeah, yeah. There's this guy who says he doesn't have a clue about what's going to happen and quite how to get there and what the outcomes will be, but I think we should hire him. <laughs> difficult, yes. <laughs> Yeah, I get it. Okay, Florian. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time for the call today. I think it's an enormous yes. value for anybody who listens to this, also for me as well. So I feel like I've indulged myself. Um, is there anything else you'd like to say on the topic before we wrap that up and close today? I, um, no, not right now on top of mind. Um, I right. do hope that if I could make it interesting enough for people to be curious about um, the session that we're going to have as well. And, and I think we will then have some more opportunities to have a conversation with people interested also. Around yeah, yeah, sure. Effectuation and some of the things we touched upon. Yeah. If, if ever there was a time when it was more clear to us, perhaps, of the need for innovation and, and quite radical change in places and our dependency on one another to be able to achieve that with adequate significance, I think now is the time. So there's nothing about our conversation today, I think, is anything yes. other than completely relevant for all of us yes. in these times. Yes. Yeah. But the, the thing that I hope is that we realize the need for innovation um, and for change. Um, it's, uh, what, what I do hope is that we also can take the approach that is more appropriate to the kind of situation. So that's still, that's, I, I see that still as something challenging because um, often we, we still take an approach being more suitable maybe to the complicated world or domain, uh, trying to deal with the stuff that we're at now. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, um, how can people find you, Florian, besides through the community? Um, well, um, I try to be found, so it should be very easy. Uh, we just, uh, so I'm on LinkedIn. So my name, Florian Rosner, um, just put them on LinkedIn and there will be my LinkedIn profile. Uh, if you put it into any search engine, you will end up on, uh, uh, my company 
on the website of the company I work for, Cree Effective. Um, I can also be found there. Um, yeah, so I think it's right. it's very easy to connect to me, but um, I'm quite active on LinkedIn, and I think that would be the easiest way for people to connect. Yeah, and approachable too. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. I, I hope so. Okay, Florian. Well, thank you so much. All right. Thank you, James. See you soon. Looking forward to seeing you soon. Take care.